So welcome back to Thrive, your agency resource. There has been a lot of energy around inclusion in the workplace, how to become more conscious of our biases as agency leaders and what to actually do about them. So today I'm joined by one of my friends, Juan Cortez, to talk about just that. Juan is the co-founder of Matter of Culture, which is an inclusive culture and employee engagement consultancy. He's also represented um, on Consciousness Leaders, which is my new venture in the world. And I'm really, really excited to have him here today. So Juan, thank you so much. I am just really grateful to have this conversation with you of all people. Thank you. Thank you. I'm super excited to, to do the same. So your background, which I didn't actually know until we started talking more, your background is actually in the marketing and advertising world. And it's been in, in really focused on um, creating employee resource groups or ERGs um, for agencies and world-class brands for like 25 years, not to, not to age you, <laughs> um, but, but <laughs> you look beautiful, um, yeah, but, but can you talk a little bit about that work? Because I, I imagine that there are a lot of people who, um, if they're not uh, part of those larger brands or part of those larger agencies, um, they don't actually know potentially what those ERGs are all about. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. Sure. So the first thing that I'll say is thank you for having me here, Kelly. I am um, my, much like you, I actually was really quite surprised about how long it's actually been <laughs> that I've been in this space. Well, it's just because um, you it, look so young. So that's why I <laughs> when I said 25 years, I was like, oh my God. Yeah, well, it's uh, there's a plus after that 25. I, I we, negated we don't need the to go plus. That far. <laughs> <laughs> the um, what I realized recently actually was that as far back as the early 90s, when I was uh, merely a tyke uh, working in New York uh, for MTV Networks, which is MTV Music Television, Nickelodeon, um, and a few others, um, I was actually part of the what at the time was called the Diversity Council which was really, at the time, there was no conversation about inclusion or belonging or equity. It was really mm -hmm. all about this kind of new buzzword called diversity. Mm -hmm. And, and our, our efforts really revolved around how do we educate ourselves about the experiences of other people who are unlike us. Mm -hmm. And that was a really rewarding experience that really kind of launched me into a career of not only learning and development, which is where I've spent a lot of my time, um, but also in terms of employee engagement and specifically around creating a sense of inclusion and belonging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, more recently, uh, I was part of, I was the VP of learning and engagement for Wonderman Thompson, which is a fairly large agency, 20,000 plus across the world, employees ac across the world. And um, when we formed, because it was a, as a series of, um, a series of um, mergers. Um, when we formed as Wonderman Thompson as this, this large conglomerate, one thing that became really clear was that there was very little engagement uh, or that engagement levels were actually going down pretty significantly. Mm. And one way that I thought might be a good way of getting people back engaged, employees engaged, was through creating opportunities for them to have a voice to share their experiences mm -hmm. and to contribute to the business in more significant ways. Mm -hmm. And I found no better way of doing that than through uh, creating the first employee resource group that mm -hmm. was created for the agency. And, and for the people who don't know necessarily what that definition is, what do you mean by an employee resource group? So an employee resource group is typically defined as a group of employees who volunteer their time because more often than not employee resource groups are um, or the efforts of employee resource groups are done outside of your working hours mm -hmm. it's often within working hours but particularly in agencies when billable time is is still rules that's a whole uh, nother uh, conversation <laughs> we don't need to go in that direction but um, worth mentioning only from the perspective that typically ERGs especially in agencies um, don't necessarily have billable hours. So don't count those as billable hours for which reason then they become volunteer hours in essence. Got it. Um, these groups are formed primarily for the purpose of creating a sense of inclusion and creating some educational components for the, for the organization, whether an agency or not. But what I felt was really most compelling about creating an ERG, again, this group of employees was how do we 
how do we leverage the employees and the experiences that we have here collectively for the purpose of moving the business forward, mm. moving the employee experience forward, and moving the communities in which we are forward. Mm. So that was kind of the, the three part or the three prong approach that I took to forming ERGs. Mm. And so whether they are specifically, uh, and ERGs typically are formed around an affinity. Uh, so it's um, a, an ERG for women or LGBTQ or um, people of color and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So that's a little bit of what ERGs are and a little bit of what my focus was in creating that for Winneman Thompson. Yeah, amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, so our, our show, our, our charge today is to talk about um, conscious inclusion, right? There's a lot of talk about consciousness, right? Um, the collective consciousness, conscious leadership, which you know I sound like a broken record. I feel like I say that that phrase about 17 times a day, um, and so on, right? Like we we are learning a whole new vocabulary here because there's there's a a new, um, I guess, new linguistics that are that are kind of coming to the the forefront, right? So what do we mean specifically by conscious inclusion, right? Because people are now familiar with diversity, equity, and inclusion, or intentional culture, or inclusive culture. But what do we mean by conscious inclusion? So conscious inclusion is really a way of talking about of moving beyond what we typically focus in on, or what many organizations are still focusing in on when it comes to efforts related to diversity, equity, inclusion. And that typically revolves around unconscious biases. It, most of the calls that I get from clients or potential clients looking for diversity training, when I ask them what they're looking for, they're like, actually, we don't know right. what, what we need. And so, but typically they do point out that one thing that they've heard a lot about is unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. And the thing about unconscious bias for me is that unconscious bias is really the precursor to it's information when we learn about our unconscious biases that gives us information that then we can use for another purpose and that purpose is really to create intentional uh, a, a more inclusive culture or um, this idea of conscious uh, inclusion mm -hmm. so if we if our biases are unconscious when we bring them up to the consciousness what do we do about that what is the action be beyond that because mm -hmm. otherwise we end up falling trapped for this idea of, well, now that I know that uh, unconscious biases are normal and are natural, that all humans have them and so on and so forth, I'm aware of them. I went through that training, so I'm good. Right. And the it's truth almost like of a matter, pass, right? Exactly right. And that pass actually has a name that's called the licensing effect. And the licensing mm -hmm. effect is really all about now that I know what I know, I'm good and I don't need to do anything else about it. Mm. So what I've done is I've, the, the term that I've been using of uh, conscious inclusion is really the movement, the actual, the action beyond or moving beyond just a, a, a sense of awareness mm -hmm. and into and putting that or setting that in motion. Mm -hmm. So for instance, um, more often than not, we are whether agencies or other organizations, we think about the issues of diversity and inclusion as it relates to how are we attracting talent and how are we, we retaining talent, right. all of which is great, but there are many other opportunities for us to also create this sense of conscious inclusion. Um, and those are some of the things that we've been working through. Right, right. So you just mentioned a really great point. I think most people would hear conscious inclusion and automatically kind of create like a, a correlation between that and like the hiring process and HR and all of that, right? Uh, because it's all about candidate selection and, and all of that. But there are actually larger um, ethical and business reasons to consider, right? So let's talk a little bit about um, the idea of like the triple bottom line, which, you know, I would imagine that most, uh, most of the people listening or watching this uh, are pretty familiar with. Yeah, so what I find is that when we begin to think about inclusion, we have to move, we have to move beyond HR and we need to move beyond recruiting. 
certainly those things are really important because if we are not even attempting to get people from different backgrounds into the organization and find ways of creating an, an environment where they can thrive and where their voices are heard, then we might get all the right numbers potentially uh, in terms of diversity, but not really get the benefits of that um, that we get when we actually include them in the day-to-day -day and in the business decisions that we make, et cetera, et cetera. Right. What I find is important about, so moving beyond just the recruiting and HR, um, I find it's important because for instance, for agencies, I find that agencies have a particular there's something uh, magical about agencies, a, a, a power that as, as agencies that we have. And that is that we, we exist for the purpose of selling stuff, of helping our brands sell stuff. If we are not being mindful about the campaigns that we're creating or the advertising uh, or the ads that we're creating and so on and so forth, uh, we might be leaving some folks behind or not really taking them into consideration. So mm -hmm. as an example, um, I've recently learned that in the world, um, there is uh, the population, about 25% of the population worldly, worldwide, uh, has some form of disability. Mm -hmm. And that disability can be physical, it can be visible, or it can be invisible, or it could be neurodiversity and so on and so forth. Right. If we are not really, if, if within our teams, we don't have the opportunity or we, we haven't taken the opportunity to create conscious inclusion for people with disabilities, we're leaving 20, 25% of people off the table. We're not including them in our, the work that we do. And we have an, we're missing an opportunity. Yeah. So that's why to me, it goes beyond the recruiting and the HR efforts. And it needs to really translate into um, how are what sources are strategists looking at when they're looking at information that helps us create the right campaign? How are the creative teams uh, looking at the people that we include in those campaigns, the actual talent that we include in those campaigns, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and things along those lines? Yeah, and then how that translates um, to this like triple bottom line effect, right? Like if you think about that, when you harness the power of all of those different perspectives across the entire life cycle of that creative process, the work is just better. Therefore, the work is more effective. Therefore, the clients are happier. Therefore, the clients stay. Therefore, you can attract like, you know, more talent that's of a higher quality, like on and on and on this like um, this cycle, right? Um, and at the end of the day, we know profitability is a lagging indicator, but by focusing here, it then leads to, you know, sort of this triple bottom line impact. So it's it's just like, it's just good business, right? This is not- It's just good business. I, I joke around sometimes. I'm like, this is not just everybody's, you know, um, holding hands and seeing Kumbaya, like that's cool too. <laughs> but it also leads to um, a more profitable, more sustainable, predictable business, right? And isn't that what 100%. we all want? A hundred percent. And, you know, truth be told, Kelly, the, what I, the, what drives me personally to do this work mm -hmm. is that it's the right thing to do. Right. I'm just, I, I like to create a, a space for all humans to feel included, right. but the business side of me does it because it is the right thing for the bottom line and for right. the business. And I think those things not being mutually exclusive is kind of like the takeaway, right? And, and we see that moving into that paradigm um, more now at a, at a more accelerated rate now than ever before. So that personally gets me excited because I'm in the same boat as you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's face it, agency life looks very different than ever before. Remote and hybrid teams need better tools to help them communicate and access files, track their time, manage client budgets, and more. If you believe that it's time to streamline things once and for all, Workamajig is the all-in-one agency management platform built to help you do just that. Head over to workamajig.com forward slash thrive to learn more. Back to the show. So um, you just gave a couple of great examples, um, but when we had talked uh, uh, earlier another time, you were um, also mentioning the impacts of some things that might be really interesting to some of the uh, technology leaders that are mm -hmm. listening to this. So talk a little bit about how um, conscious inclusion can impact things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, because that's definitely something that we have to consider with this as well. 
Sure. You know, the truth of the matter is that technology, you know, whether machine learning or artificial intelligence or a combination of both, mm-hmm. um, is permeating our lives, whether we are aware of that or not. And the, it's happening and the underneath also, the surface a bit. <laughs> exactly right. Exactly right. And so if we are not paying close attention, artificial intelligence uh, is still fed, the information is still fed by humans. That's right. If humans are not aware of their biases and um, they are developing this as technologists, then the, the very systems that are intended to help us move forward are going to have, are, are going to be less, are going to be flawed. Yeah. They're going to be less than perfect. Yeah. And we've seen many examples of that of organizations like universities who have used machine learning and artificial intelligence for their selection process with the purpose of actually being less uh, or be more inclusive and it actually backfired because the information that was fed into it uh, into those algorithms was not a- appropriate or was not inclusive in nature it was it was riddled with the biases of the folks who created right, them right and i bring it up because i don't want people to think that this is just about the ad campaigns that are so visible in our world right um it is also the the technology that we sometimes don't even know is powering some of the things that we're digesting. So, you know, obviously the show is for creative and technology leaders. And I think it's important to bring up that conscious inclusion and unconscious bias and all these things, like we have to have these conversations and then actually to your point earlier, do something about it, right? It's Mm -hmm. not enough to just have the conversations and say, okay, these are things that we should be aware of. No, actually, what are we going to do? And these are the conversations we need to have in our organizations. Or if we don't know how to have those conversations, hiring a team, you know, that that can help a consultancy that can help is, you know, that's that's one of the next steps, right? Exactly right. Yeah. Yeah, I find that uh, Kelly. On that note, I find that um, that is an important component. Is that we also cannot just, as agency leaders, we can't just go out there and pretend that we know what we don't know and create campaigns that we think are inclusive. Because then we come up with, you know, terrible campaigns like Pepsi Oof, uh, did a few say. years back. Right, exactly. <laughs> so uh, the 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 uh, yeah, I won't go any, any further into that. But that is exactly there is right. a tone, a deafness that comes from not really being part of that experience or not having consulted people who are have have been part of that experience right. as an underrepresented group. Um, Think about also, for instance, uh, from a technology perspective, if I am designing websites or apps, um, how am I making them more accessible so that right. folks who are visually impaired can navigate through them? Right. And you know, there are the, there's the legality side of that. So setting that aside completely, there's just a, a, a drive from my perspective, there's, there should be a drive to be more inclusive because being more inclusive doesn't exclude anybody. So it's right. not, there's no, there's no downside to right. any of it, right. um, but it does require more energy and it requires more, um, uh, it, it requires us to be more deliberate. Right. And isn't that what it's all about, right? Being more intentional and more deliberate and more considerate of others, right? Exactly. Um, yeah. I mean, as we start to kind of wrap up a little bit, I could hear, you know, some of the, 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 people who are in in the audience listening to this or watching this on video um your background is clearly with larger organizations right like that Mm -hmm. wpp level most Mm -hmm. of the people listening to this are in smaller agencies run smaller agencies or or have some kind of leadership position in a smaller agency so how do we translate something like the idea of, of um an erg or the idea of um conscious inclusion into smaller agencies so I think that a smaller agency can still create an ERG. So there are there are ways to create these affinity groups uh, and to put that out into internally and really understand and figure out who's there, who can actually be a part of that. Mm-hmm. And perhaps the affinity is not so specific to one particular group. Right. It might be broader. Right. But beyond that, 
and I think that what, what these groups are working, even working at one of Thompson while I was there, there was one particular office that was fairly small and they were struggling with how do we create an ERG here for this particular office? Mm -hmm. And what they did is that they created a group that they called something like the diversity group. It was something you know relatively innocuous, but mm -hmm. um, in essence, what they did is that they created a series, they brought ideas to leadership um, and they uh, created a, a series of um, relationships. They established relationships with local community leaders from various organizations uh. that they invited to come in. And once a month, they had um, an opportunity to uh, have a veteran talk to them about their experience. Um, they had gender nonconforming folks come in and talk to them. So, and and most of this was actually done gratis because these were community leaders who were really looking to bring their um, their message forward. Yeah. So those are some of the things that as smaller agencies we can still do. I love that idea. I absolutely love that idea because then it really goes into, if you think about what the part of the equation, quote unquote, of conscious leadership is, right? It's like, yes, taking care of your employees, also considering your impact on the community. And that mm -hmm. impact can actually be reciprocal, right? Because what you're saying is that they went to the community leaders or people in the community from uh, different groups and they were able to um, bring them in and develop those relationships and actually kind of gain some insight or extract some knowledge. Uh, as, a, as a reciprocal thing, there could be um, you know, a donation or volunteerism on the part of the, of the agency or the organization mm -hmm. back to that group, right? Like that's a beautiful exchange. I, I think that that's a wonderful idea. I love that. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm all about reciprocity. So I, I, I'm always looking for relationships where um, there is a, an even exchange or, or at least an ongoing exchange. Yeah. Um, and so exactly right. I think that, you know, certainly if you're a larger organization, you know, pony up and help these organizations with money. But if you are smaller, you still can do it uh, on a volunteer basis and, and think about how do we how do we give back? Is it volunteer hours? Is it that we create a campaign for them? And that's actually a lot of what happened uh, yeah. when I when I was working at one of Thompson. Yeah, yeah, we did that at my former agency. Also, we did um, most of our clients were nonprofits. So we did small fundraising campaigns for like the local animal shelter or the local food pantry. Um, and, and then also um, volunteered with those organizations as sort of an extension of that contribution. So there are lots of ways, you know, that you can do this. And uh, anyhow, this is such a great conversation. You know, it's uh, one of my favorite things to talk about. And, and I love talking to you. So thank you so much, uh, Juan, for being on the show. I really, really appreciate your time and your wisdom. Thank you. It's been my pleasure. This episode has been brought to you by Workamajig the number one creative agency management software. Show notes at thrive.workamajig.com. Find out how your creative agency can become more productive and more profitable. Schedule your demo at thrive.workamajig.com.